Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sammasambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sammasambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sammasambuddhasa Kinang puranang nawang nati sambawang virata chitayati ke bawasming Teki na bija awirul hichanda nibanti dira yatayang padipo ti. This is now the last month of the, the was awasa, the rainy season retreat period. And I've already mentioned that the first part of the rainy season retreat, I like to talk about methods of calming the mind down, getting into deep meditation, getting the the mind quieter, calmer, more clear, more mindful, to be able to sustain the attention. All these trainings of the mind. But as you all know, those trainings of the mind in calmness, in clarity, in the ability to see deeply into things, into uh, suppressing the five hindrances, they are there for a purpose. And that is the purpose of Yata Bhutiyana Dasana, to see things as they truly are. Seeing things as they truly are is part of the function of insight. In the last uh, talks of the rainy season retreat, now you hopefully see the emphasis change uh, on from calming the mind down to more developing the insight practices. Is what happens after the mind calms down, which I'll be focusing on now. What one does afterwards. It's the case that from the development of samadhi, that one sees things as they truly are. But nevertheless, even though this does become an automatic process, it's part of the, the function of all the teachings which you've heard, all the uh, suttas which you have read is part of the result of all of that learning that after a deep meditation the mind will be inclining and looking in that area to see what those teachings truly mean and how they match up to the deepest experiences of the mind. But nevertheless, even though this is an automatic process, the Buddha always talked about uh, inclining the mind to one of three things after the development of samadhi, anicca, dukkha, anatta, the three characteristics of this thing we call samsara, this thing which we call body and mind. In particular, to use those three characteristics to focus on the five khandhas, or the six sense bases, or, what, or the four satipatthanas. These are all the objects on which anicca, dukkha, anatta can play around, can investigate, to can uncover and reveal the truth of these things. And I thought it would be a good uh, little plan for me for the next three talks to spend this talk on talking about anicca and next week on dukkha and the week afterwards on anatta. So this talk this evening is on anicca. Anicca, the impermanence or the uncertainty of things which was Ajahn Chah's uh, preferred rendering of the term anicca it's a term which we can see in everyday life, but it's a term which we need to also apply to the deepest experiences of the mind. Uh, first of all, that one has to apply it to the candors, the five candors, and the most obvious candor is the, the rupa candor, the body and all the material things of our world. What Anicca teaches you is that nature is going to steal these things from you anyway. They're going to take away your body. They're going to take away your health. They're going to take away your monastery. 
they're going to take away whatever it is which you delight in or which you hate, both. Any child, the nature, doesn't really care, has no preferences to what it takes away. And when one contemplates that all of these things, because they belong to nature, nature's got the right to take it at any time. It's got the right to take your life at any moment. It's got the right to take your health. It's got the right to take your money, your children, your house at any time because that's what anicca means. All these things are subject to disappearance. The word nietzsche, which is the opposite of anicca, I always like to learn my Pali, not so much from the, the dictionaries, but I like to learn a lot of Pali from the Vinaya because there the Pali words were used in concrete experiences of life. And uh, there was a type of meal offering called Nicha Bata. Bata means meal. And the Nicha Bata meant somebody who would come either every day or once a week or on the Uposita days. There's many people in this monastery bring Nicha Bata every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, whatever day of the week it is, they come regularly. That's called Nicha Bata. <coughs> it's a constant, regular, repeated, something you can depend upon. And this is the opposite of Anicca. What the Buddha was saying with the word Anicca is these things aren't constant. That you cannot depend upon them. They are unreliable. And that uncertainty, unreliability, inconstancy is this other aspect of anicca which is well worth reflecting upon. This body is unreliable, inconstant. Any material possession is unreliable, inconstant. You should, should not look for security in this body. You should not look for security in a health fund or a pension. You should not look for security in your possessions. Each of these things is going to be taken away from you at any time. It's uncertain, not depending, not uh, dependable. This is what the word anicca means. What that perception, that realization does is actually to first of all help along the letting go, the lack of attachment, the ability to renounce things. You're going to have to get rid of them anyway. Why not renounce them now? Why not, as Ajahn Chah used to say, like the glass when you first receive it, it's already broken. It's of the nature to be broke. When a baby is born, it's of the nature to die. It has death written all over it. And so when one sees that at the very beginning that your glass, your cup is already broken, then again it's you don't attach to broken things. You just when it does break there, we used it, it's gone, finished. This is the way to use our requisites, to use our body, to realise in that deep sense it's already dead. It's got the nature of death in it. Like death is something already lurking in the parts of the body. There are parts of the body which are dying every moment. Cells are dying and they're getting excreted through your urine or feces or whatever. The skin is flaking off, the hair needs to be shaved or cut. Things are dying all the time in this body. It's got death all over it. And seeing it in this way, we're seeing the, the uncertainty, unreliability of our own body. And how much more should we look at the uh, lack of dependence on another person, person's body? Unreliable. You can't gain any happiness or pleasure from another person's body. The Buddha used to say, Apasukha bahudukha. Small amount of happiness, big amount of suffering. You can apply that to everything concerned with rupa, kanda. 
when you start to contemplate this on your body, on these arms and these legs, if you contemplate it fully, you can see just this whole body is already fading away. You get nimittas coming up in the mind. Nimittas are just ways that perception is telling you that the practice is working. You're beginning to see things in a new way. Because of the inclination of the mind to investigate impermanence, it starts to see these things disappearing, fading in front of your eyes. It's just a nimitta, that sort. It's just a meditation experience. It's just perception, seeing what Ajahn Chah said he saw, just a broken crack in the glass, which everyone else thought was whole. It's what perception does. It sees the nature of things. And so seeing the, the crack in this body, seeing the death in this body, seeing the fading away in the body, seeing the impermanence in the body, it means we can use this but ready at every moment to give it away. The same with our health, which is part of Rupa Kanda. Knowing that this health has always got its cracks in it. Diseases are constantly present in the body, just waiting for a time of weakness. A time when karma, bad karma from the past, can have an opportunity to express its fruit it's just the law of nature happening, that's all. And knowing that this body is always open to disease at any moment, it's like the cup has always got a crack in it. What it means if you know that a cup has got a crack in it, you look after it. You know that it's always reminding you how vulnerable it is. So you make use of it to drink your tea. When it does crack, it's gone. We always expected that. The body should never be seen as anything substantial. Other people's bodies, not substantial. If you can do that practice with your own body, then it should overcome the lust for somebody else's body. If you can do that reflection on anicca to possessions, it should drop the uh, what is it, the, the illusion, the entanglement, the cherishing of possessions. You just realize that possessions are just so much junk in your rooms. You try and get rid of it as much as possible. So, anicca towards rupa, anicca towards vedana. These vedanas, the happiness or the suffering, the joy, the pain, the delight and the misery. But sometimes we think that these are under our control, that these are somehow dependable, that if we can only get our meditation together, then we can have happiness all the time. The practice after a deep meditation just sees the nature of Vedana and all of the six senses. You can just see just how it's just totally conditioned by things beyond your power. Everyone would like to be healthy and have no sickness in the body. Everyone would always love just to have praise and people saying what a great monk, what a great nun, what a great Anagarika you are. Whether it's a Vedana from the sense base of sound, whether it's a Vedana from the sense base of sight, smell, taste. Even if sometimes that you might think if you could only go out to a nice restaurant, you can get whatever food you want. If you're Burmese, you can get some nice Burmese food instead of this rotten Australian food. You can get some English food, you can get whatever food it is you really like. But all of those Vedanas which, which come from that, they're never satisfying. It's, they're gone in a moment. Taste, especially if you eat fast like I do, it just goes so quickly. So anicca, so important. It's undependable, it's uncertain. You never know what it's going to taste like anyway. So if you depend for Vedana, on Vedana for your happiness, for your security, 
then you're going to find there's nothing there, only suffering. When you investigate those candors, you find that the, the way that Vedana works, as you've heard me say before, is just this constant interplay, mostly between suffering and happiness, where happiness is just a gap between two moments of suffering. Suffering, just a gap between two moments of happiness. So whenever you're suffering, always remember that this is the forerunner of happiness. Whenever you're happy, remember that this is the, uh, the prelude to suffering. And look at that. When you look at that with a mind which is able to see the truth rather than just see what you want to see, you see that that's the nature of our life. Just look at happiness and suffering through each one of the senses. Beauty and ugliness, nice sounds, rotten sounds, tastes, smells, feelings in the body. Whenever you've got a headache, when that headache goes, you feel happy. If you're sick now, the suffering of the sickness is directly related to the health you had before. You can't have one without the other. And the mind states you have, the joy and the suffering in the mind, aren't they codependent on each other? Isn't one just a passing away of the other? You see the, the play of Vedana, the dependence on causes, they're unreliable. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to see that all Vedana is completely unreliable? You can't rely upon that for your fulfilment. You cannot make Vedana a goal of your life. You cannot aspire to heaven in any form, in any realm, in any way or means. Because the idea of heaven becomes completely irrational, just cannot exist. Vedana is always changing, coming and going. Well, this is a Satipatthana, this is a contemplation of a Kanda. In that third Satipatthana, it's contemplating the Jitta, contemplating the rise and the fall, the appearance and the complete disappearance of Jitta according to Satipatthana taught by the Lord Buddha. This is seeing the impermanence even in Jitta. This is one of the Satipatthanas which not many people do. That they don't do it because a prerequisite, I would say it's a prerequisite of all Satipatthanas, but it's an obvious prerequisite to all sati, for the third Satipatthana of Chitanusati to have jhanas because otherwise you just have got no clue what jitta is. It's jitta. What is it? In the practice of anapanasati, you get to know the jitta as a nimitta reflected in the mind. This is how you see the jitta. If you haven't got nimitta, stable, clear, beautiful. You've got no way of knowing what the nimitta is. You can speculate, you can think, you can read and, and infer from other people, but that's not knowing of it yourself. And if you just rely on other people's teachings, so often you'll misinterpret and miss the point. One has to go to the very experience of these things, the experience of mind, pure mind. As I've mentioned in a simile some years ago. It's like a person who wants to find out what gold is. You have to rid the gold of all the other impurities, all the other elements which can deceive you about the true quality of that metal gold. You've got to heat it up, get out rid of all the dross, all the other stuff which is 
mixed in with that gold. And when you got pure gold, just gold, nothing else but gold, then you can know what its properties are. In the same way that jitta, mind, you've got to get rid of all the other stuff before you can know what jitta really is. You have to get rid of the five senses, allow them to completely disappear. So you've just got mind and nothing but mind. And then you can actually see how it works and what it is. And one of the experiences which you should be able to uh, reflect upon after a jhana is that this jitta is not a continuous flow, it's particular, like grains of sand on a beach. If you look at it from a distance, you think it's a continuous flow of sand. If you look a bit closer, you can find these little bits with spaces in between. Jitta arises. Jitta passes away. Spaces between the falling away and the arising of the next jitta. These are not things which are easy to see. These are things which one has to see through deep samadhi. That's why this is called the reflection of anicca. <coughs> it's, you, in, you can't depend upon that jitta. It's unreliable. You can't hold your hat, put your hat on that. You cannot hang anything on it. Because it's always moving, disappearing. Giving the illusion of a continuous knower, either in a, in a coarse form or a fine form. But if you look deeper, you'll see it's nothing continuous there at all. Just a rising and a falling. It's subject to cessation. It's subject to disappearing, to going. That's why in the sutta we just chanted, the Dhammachaka Sutta, the realization of the stream winner, Yankinchi Samudhiya Dhamman, all that which is of the nature to arise, Sabantang Niroda Dhammanti, all of that is of the nature to cease, to disappear, to go. You see that with the jitta as well. You see that with sanya, these perceptions which we take to be so real. The perception which informs the mind and gives it some way of holding on to this world and describing it. All those perceptions which we believe in. There's a great connection between perception and language. That's when we see the impermanence, the unreliability, the undependability of sanya. That we get to be less concerned about language and thoughts and concepts and ideas. It's one of the uh, helpful experiences of my education to have come across, to, to have studied something like theoretical physics and come across, first of all, uh, teachings such as you know, relativity theory. Because that's changed your perceptions. And you started to have to really work with perceptions to be able to understand that sort of stuff. You, know, the, you had this perception, this worldview, the way of looking at the world, of this universe just being like this sphere going off into infinity in all directions. And then you were taught and it was explained and proved beyond any doubt that this universe is curved, that space curves. And first of all, you, th you thought, not actually space being curved, but things in space being curved, like pathways curving around within space. But that wasn't what this was talking about. This was actually the space itself was curved, was bent. You go in a straight line, a perfect straight line. And if it's a closed universe, you come right back to where you started from. It was uh, a way of perceiving which went against my training. You had to, to 
look at things in a different way. You came across quantum theory, where again your perceptual apparatus was stretched to the limit, were broken and reformed, to be able to understand that sort of stuff. What it was actually showing you was just the limits of this thing which we call perception. Our perception is constructed in our schooling, by our parents, by our friends, by our reading. There's nothing substantial to it. There's nothing real and truthful, dependable in your perception. You can perceive things one way today and perceive it in another way the following day. And if you're unfortunate like me and all your talks get taped, you find yourself contradicting yourself. It's not contradicting yourself, it's just perception changing, that's all. It's anicca, impermanent, not dependable. When you actually start to see the, the fact you cannot depend upon your perception, it's unreliable, what does that do? Because your whole world starts to fade and disappear. Ideas, concepts, ways of looking at things start to melt away. You get into a, like a form of emptiness there. And because of the unreliability of perception, something so basic to existence, you can't depend upon anything at all. It's as if like the, the, the floor on which you're sitting is, just disappears. You've got nothing to stand on. You're letting go. Things are disappearing. The whole process is unwinding and stopping. Sometimes that people can think like this, they can follow those sorts of ideas and it gets weird and wonderful. But they find they can't really do it because it's not really coming from the place of seeing, it's coming from the place of thinking. They're not s stopping the perceptions, they're just getting another perception. And these ways of investigating the candors and seeing they're unreliable, they come and they go, one perception arises and then it disappears, which one is the right one, which is the wrong one, they're just perceptions, that's all. The same as the sankharas, the fourth of the candors, all these thoughts and ideas, everything you've ever thought, where's it come from, why do you think this way and not another way? And why are you so stupid to think that your thoughts are correct? At last I've got it right. How many times in your life have you thought that way? At last I've got it right. Yeah, this is the right way. This is the right religion. This is the right path. This is right. Later on to be proved that you're wrong. And how many times I've said in here that you cannot rely upon the thinking process. But the thing is that People think that that's true and they rely upon that thought again rather than letting go of all the thoughts. Just like this simile of space being curved. It's the, the whole background is curved, not just what goes on in there. It's not just the objects being curved, it's the subject being curved as well. This is one of the problems with actually seeing anicca. You want to find a place which is Nietzsche to see anicca. You take out some part of the world, some part of the universe, some part of the mind and you say, this is permanent, this is me, this is a self, the ultimate ground of all being. And you can accept everything else is anicca, but not this. And this which you take to be permanent, first one is the will, the doer. In that Gata, which I said at the beginning. You may remember that's from the Ratana Sutta. This is Kinang Puranang Nawang Nati Sambhavan Virata Chittaiti Kebhavasmi Te Kina Bija Awirulhi Chanda Having destroyed the seed, take those who have destroyed the seed, Te Kina Bija Awirulhi Chanda This Chanda, this desire, very close to the word intention, will. Now we will he. It doesn't sort of grow anymore. It starts to wilt and die. 
This is actually the will being seen as completely unreliable, nothing to do with me. It's nice to see, to focus on chedana, on will, on chanda, desire, to see it come, to see it go. Because this is the doer which I keep talking about, the me which controls, or what one thinks is the me which controls. In the, the practice of jhanas, getting into a jhana, you're always faced with this difficulty of getting rid of the doer because there's something inside, deep inside, which wants to be the thing which gives up the doer. It sort of gives up the doer outside, but never gives up the doer inside. And one always sort of goes back to another place inside which one does. As you're meditating, as well as like uh, focusing or getting the perception of the one who knows, get the perception of the one who does, the doer. Reflect upon that a lot. What is this thing which does? If you move, what did the moving? If you think, what did the thinking? If a perception arise, what chose that particular perception above all other possible perceptions of that time? What did this? If the mind progresses in meditation, what did that? It's fascinating to watch Dua. I was talking to someone today about sometimes watching the body. The body moves this way, the body does moves another way. If you're very mindful, sometimes you see that you didn't do that at all. It just happened by itself. It's a fascinating thing to watch this. Sometimes I remember once when I was on Tudong, I was walking for a long distance. I was walking for many hours, mindful. And after a while, I just, I wasn't doing the walking. I was completely mindful, just watching the body walk all by itself. It was been walking all day and it basically, it just would do it without me telling it. It was like trained. And actually to see the body move like that, very clearly, very mindful, and you weren't doing it. What happened to the doer? The doer had gone. So much of that which we call doing is an illusion of something permanent, something constant, the one in control. In the Sankara, the fourth of the uh, of the Kandas, Sometimes like will is the most important one of that, of the fourth kanda. Will, chanda. If one could actually see that, focus on that, with looking for its impermanence, uncertainty. Because do you rely on the will? Are you really in control? After a while you find you can't depend upon that. You can't depend upon being the driver of your car. There's so many other things which influence the way the car goes. It's one of those realizations for anyone who ever gets in a position of authority. So the more authority you have, the less control you have. I remember reading this about this uh, biography of a, of a man who was in the Royal Navy, who went up through the ranks and finally became a captain of this big aircraft carrier. And he said that when he was like a, just an ordinary sailor or a young officer, always having to follow orders, and he sort of dreamed of the time when he was the captain and he could give the orders. But by the time he became a captain, he realised he had much more freedom as just an ordinary rating in the Navy. Once he was a captain of the ship, but there was hardly any freedom to make commands at all. The commands were almost automatic, had to be done. There were so many pressures on him from all sorts of directions. Sometimes you realise that this is a way of will, of choice. It's an illusion to think that there's some place, somewhere you can be in full, full control of these things. All the choice, will, is conditioned. 
it rises and passes away. The doer comes and the doer goes. See the rise and fall of Chaitanya, the rise and fall of will, the rise and fall of that kanda. And then you will never ever again depend upon that. We depend upon our will for our happiness. We depend upon our will for our sense of freedom. We are depending upon something which cannot give us, those, give us those things. The people who cultivate their will, become strong will, control their life, control their existence, gain the means to exercise will, power, wealth, they don't have any freedom. They don't have as much happiness as one who lets go. Why do we depend upon will? Invest so much hope in will because we don't see its uncertainty. It's will which makes us move in a certain way, which makes us choose. It's unreliable and uncertain. Sometimes will makes mistakes. Don't feel guilty about the mistakes you make in life. Blame will, that's all. It's will's fault, not mine. It's the doer's fault. It's unreliable. No one is perfect in the world, as the old saying goes. Everyone makes mistakes. You cannot depend upon choice, will, to always be correct. Don't rely upon that. Don't invest so much effort and energy into that. Instead, invest a lot of hope in this opposite, the letting go, detaching, giving up such things. Anicca sees these things rise and fall. Anicca sees these things as being uncertain. Anicca sees that these are undependable, things which promise so much, but which deliver so little, which always tend to let you down. If you cultivate will, it will disappoint you. Seeing this anicca of will makes it easy to let it go. It makes it easy just to sit in meditation and allow things to disappear. Will is what makes you move. Will is what disturbs and agitates the mind. Will is what creates the fear and the excitement. It's the barriers to freedom. It's the barriers to the peace, the letting go, the emptiness of the jhanas. It's a barrier to the complete stopping and ending of the five khandhas. So see if you can, by getting rid of the seed, in this case delusion, be one who can say, Awi Rulhi Chanda. The will is not growing anymore, but the will is wilting. The choice, doing, is disappearing. The doer is dying. The last of the candors is again his consciousness, Vinyana. But you just see that start to see the impermanence of consciousness. See, it's unreliable. We want to be because we think that in being we're going to have some fun, some fulfillment, we're going to get somewhere. What do you want to be for? What's so good about being? There's a, a deep misunderstanding, a deep misunderstanding causing craving that there's something really worthwhile in being. Buddha said that being is suffering, but still we'd rather be and suffer than not be at all. There's something very fearful about not being. But to see that which is, again, at the heart of this idea of being, knowing, consciousness, mind, to see what that is, to see the six types of consciousness which the Buddha taught as a sense basis depend upon I and forms. I consciousness arises. When those eyes or those forms disappear or they part, I consciousness 
ceases. It's as simple as that. When the sounds and the ear, the hearing base, and they come together, then this ear consciousness, sound consciousness arises. And then it disappears again. You may be listening to me or listening to the rain. Feeling consciousness is gone. Now it's sound consciousness. Taste, smell, physical touch, or mind consciousness. When there's mind objects and there's mind, and they come together, there's the arising of mind consciousness. And then mind consciousness disappears. All the consciousnesses, the Buddha said so clearly, because they're dependent upon conditions, when those conditions come and go, so does consciousness come and go. But it's hard to see consciousness gone because what can see consciousness gone when there's no consciousness to see anything? This is where the inference which comes from the deep meditations will help you. In the jhanas, you've still got the one consciousness left, the mind consciousness, which is the reason why you can know anything at all within those jhanas. But five consciousnesses have completely disappeared. The anicca, they've ceased. You realise that you can't depend upon those things, completely uncertain, they come and go. Not someone you can rely upon. And to see just the whole world, karma loka, all this which most people know, this world of the five senses, the whole universe, as far as most people are concerned, completely disappears. And that's a, a pretty neat experience of anicca, of impermanence, things disappearing, going. And again, it's not just the objects on the screen which come and go, it's the whole screen goes. This anicca is much deeper than most people imagine. The whole world, the universe, and even the knower itself, that which knows the universe, that which plays in the universe, the doer. The whole thing going, disappearing, vanishing. See all vijnana just rising and passing away into nothing. In the Satipatthana, the rise and fall is actually seeing the dependent origination and dependent cessation of all these things. You know, Patitra Samupada. That's what rise and fall means. Rising and fall sees all these things are conditioned. The cessation of Aweja is the cessation of all Sankaras, all will. Cessation of all of the consciousness, all Nama Rupa, everything just going. It's wonderful to be able to see that. That's why again, to see whatever is the nature of a rise, all those twelve things in Paticca Samupada is all of a nature to, nature to cease. All those twelve things in Paticca Samupada, every one of those, the nature to completely end. That was the way that Kondanya expresses enlightened experience. When one actually sees all of this, then one can understand that gata of the Ratana Sutta, kinang puranang, all that is gone, is past, the old stuff has been destroyed. The causes for existence, craving, awija, the not seeing of the impermanence of everything, it just rises and passes away. In the Sangyutta, the Buddha said, you can't say that there's nothing because you can see a rising. You can't say that there is, uh, there is something because you can see a passing. It's the metaphor which I like to use as the point in mathematics. It's got no size to it, no extension. In that sense, it doesn't exist. But it's not nothing, it's a point, it does exist. It's almost something halfway in between what most people would call existence or persistence and nothingness at all. This is the Buddha's middle way. It's rise and fall, anicca. 
That's what the Buddha said is the nature of life, is life. Is this anicca, is basic, fundamental. So you see the rise and the fall, the passing away of things. See that Kinang Purana, the old stuff is destroyed. Kinang Purana, Nawang Nati Sambawang. The new stuff is nothing being made, nothing being constructed, no more doing. Nawang Nati Sambawang, Virata Chitai Kebo Wasmi. The mind is no longer, as it destroyed, delights in being. Taking which are all he chanted Nibanti Dira, Nibanti Dira, Yatayang Padipa. It's certainly going to be extinguished, just like this lamp. The Buddha was giving a simile there of what Nibbana means. Nibanti Dira, Yatayang Padipa. They will be extinguished, just like the lamps are extinguished. The flame doesn't go anywhere. It's just gone, finished with, ended. In the same way that last night we were talking in the Salaika Sutta, in the last part of the Salaika Sutta, he said all of these qualities, parinibbana, they're using the word parinibbana for things like... um, uh, what is it, like uh, pride or like, uh, uh, oh, some of the other, like just qualities of mind actually disappearing. Where does pride go when it's parinibbanas? Where do the five hindrances go when they're parinibbana? They don't go to some ground of all five hindrances. They're just gone, finished with. Seeing anicca completely in that way means there's nothing there to hold on to, nor is there anything to do any holding on to. The inside, outside is all impermanent, unreliable, subject to arising, subject to cessation. Where can there be any craving coming from such an insight? Where can there be any upadana, any taking up clinging from such an insight? Where can there be any worrying, any shaking from such an insight? And where can there be any future existence from such an insight? To be able to see any charges so deeply with each of the five candors. Where is the problem? If you have a problem with sickness or pain. What is the problem? Is it the sickness or is it the Vedana? If it's the Vedana, just remember the Buddha said Vedana just like the plop of rain on a puddle. Go outside and look at the rain fall. you see a, a one raindrop hit a puddle, plop. And that's Vedana, the Buddha said. That's feelings of pain and happiness. And always remember that no matter how painful it gets, no matter how hard to endure, so it's got to change. And you're going to get your supply of happiness later on. You're going to get your supply of misery. If you're having a good time now, yours is to come, your suffering. If you're having suffering now, your happiness is coming up later. So it gives them this idea of, well, you know, I'm doing it hard now, but it's going to get better later. It has to. It's a, the fundamental nature of things, that happiness is just a gap between two bits of suffering. Suffering is just a gap between two bits of happiness. You know, even if your guts are not aching as much as they usually do today, that means it's a good day. <laughs> it's the nature of these things. So if you're sick, and look at Vedana, Anicca, unreliable, undependent. What do you expect of having a body? You got sucked into getting born again. Don't do it again. Stupid. If it's perception that sickness is bad or sickness is wrong or you know being stupid is bad or stupid is wrong because you get things wrong and you don't quote the suttas like you're supposed to quote them you get mistakes whatever, whatever perception is, is it perception which is the problem which is causing the suffering and because especially anger is often caused through 
perception. Looking at somebody else and sort of thinking that they're doing it for this reason. And so often perceptions are completely unreliable. They weren't doing that at all. Completely different reason. Don't get sucked into perceptions. Perceptions are very unreliable indeed. They're mirages, the Buddha said. Mirages are like that, completely unreliable. You think it's one thing, in truth it's something completely different. That's why in the in the Purusapugala Sutta, that phrase there that about the jhanas, whatever you think it's going to be, it's going to be otherwise. You know, it was when I first read that, that really sort of stuck out in me and that became, I kept on talking about that a lot. Whatever you think it is, it's going to be otherwise. So all of you haven't got jhanas yet, those of you who haven't got jhanas yet, whatever you think it's going to be, I guarantee it's going to be otherwise, because that's what the Buddha said. You know, as a monk you try and describe these things, but my descriptions are just the way I perceive. Your description is going to be different. So whatever you expect it to be, it will be different. Perceptions unreliable. Sankaras. If it's your problem is thinking. Why do you rely upon thoughts? So think, thinking is always a liar. Look upon thought like being a politician. Like thinking is just like an MP in Parliament trying to convince you of something. Don't believe in it. They just talk a lot, but no real substance. If you pick apart what they say, it's just like picking apart a plantain tree or an onion. No substance to what's being said in Parliament House throughout the world. How much substance is there, real core, to any of your thoughts? Or are they just completely conditioned coming from causes? Whatever the, the problem is of suffering difficulty, look upon it in the terms of the five candors. And then look upon it in terms of anicca, uncertainty, unreliability, I, not, dependable, not dependable at all. And all the problems disappear. You realise that as Bhikkhuni Wajiri kept on saying, that all there is is just dukkha arising and dukkha passing away. That's all there ever is, ever was, ever will be. So if you're having a great time this evening, this is just dukkha arising, dukkha passing away. If you're in great suffering this evening, this is just dukkha arising, dukkha passing away. When you go out, it's just dukkha arising, dukkha passing away. When you get into a jhana, it's just dukkha arising, dukkha passing away. When you sort of really get crazy and stupid, it's just dukkha arising, dukkha passing away. So don't hold on to these things. If you can really say that's all that you see, just dukkha arising, dukkha passing away, then you're an arahat. So what Bhikkhuni Wajiri said, just is seen through impermanence, seen it to its end, the rising and falling of something which needs to be let go of. But that dukkha should be the subject of the next talk in a week's time. This is just an anicca, the unreliability, undependability, impermanence of all phenomena. Get into impermanence. It's a bit scary at first, but it gives you so much freedom. Basically it just wipes the whole blackboard of all the problems. It's free, there's nothing there. It gets all the chalk marks off and then it wipes the blackboard out. There's no even blackboard, no even wall behind the blackboard, no even school in which the blackboard is. And then even the cloth disappears and the person wiping that cloth is gone. And everything is just gone completely anicca. What rises has passed away. That's anicca this evening. Is there any comments or questions? Okay. <coughs>